When I was approaching retirement, I started to get a tremendous amount of mail. Lots of mail. It was all junk mail. But it was a lot. And it came in four categories. Now, not in any particular order. The first of these categories were, uh, was uh, invitations to go on cruises, ocean cruises, river cruises up, uh, you know, fancy rivers in Europe. They sounded very sophisticated. And um, <clears throat> I wasn't interested, round file. Then the second group of ads that I used to get, and still get them, in fact, I got one this morning, hearing aids. <laughs> What's that you say? <laughs> hearing aids. And uh, my feeling about hearing aids was, well, I was doing okay without them. Just please, just speak more slowly and, and don't mumble and I'll get by. So round file. Uh, the third one is a lot of ads for cemeteries, and, um, and, and I was thinking, cemeteries, now, this is interesting. I, th this holds my attention a little bit longer because even though I do have a place to live right now, I'm thinking in the future I might want something long term. So, I'm grateful for these ads to some extent. Um, the fourth bunch of ads that keep coming to the house are ads for reverse mortgage. And reverse mortgage is yet one more scam that the banks have. And basically what it is, is you get old and you're retired and they send you a letter and they say, hey, we know that you're not working, you're retired, you're on a fixed income. Um, Let's make a deal. You can forego paying your mortgage payments, and we'll just take a little bit of money out of your equity. We'll take the equity out of your house. So basically, you spend all your life working really hard to, to get your house, and then when you're older, the bank takes it back stone by stone. I was not interested in a reverse mortgage, but it did kind of make me wonder, what other things could be reversed in my life? Like, what about aging? <laughs> well, you know, reverse aging, I'm not so sure, but there's a lot of stuff written about how to slow aging down. And then I also thought, well, what about karma? I mean, maybe I could reverse karma. Some of my karma is not so great, and it would be nice to, like, turn it around. And I, and I thought, well, let's see, is there a way for me to take the harms that have been done to me and some of the harms that I've done to other people and convert them into something positive in the world? Or even more precisely, is there a way for me to take back the harms that I have done to others? And quite simply, the answer is no, you can't. You did it, you did it, that's it. But I kept thinking maybe there is some way, some way to change the trajectory of, of karma. And, uh, you know, it made me think about something that happened to me when I was eight. Not a big deal. It's not something I remember very often, but I was eight years old and I went to a summer camp, a day camp. And the boys group was lined up by the side of the pool. And some bully in the group came up to me and without any warning whatsoever, he pushed me and he knocked the wind right out of me. And I landed in the water, in the pool. I did not know how to swim. And I sank like a stone right to the bottom of that pool. And the first thing I noticed was how quiet it was. It was really nice. It was quiet. <laughs> and there was this eerie green-blue light that was shimmering in the water. And that was kind of interesting. And I landed all fours right down at the bottom of the pool, right by the drain. And I thought, wow, this is, this is strange, I, I, but I need air. I needed to breathe. And so I started drinking water, and then I inhaled. And the next thing I knew, I was 
pulled up out of the pool, and I was on the side of the pool, kind of spitting up and coughing and trying to get my air, and there's water coming out of me. And by the time I got my senses back, I was thinking, why did that kid do that to me? What, what, what did I do to deserve this? And I realized I hadn't done anything to deserve it. It was just a matter of this guy kind of setting his place in the pecking order. And he was letting me know, he's up here. And obviously, I belong down there in the pool by the drain. So, I, I thought, you know, wow, this is really odd. This is how the world works. People push you around, and they're strong, and they're bigger. And he knew that there was no way I was going to be the kind of guy who'd come up to him afterwards and smack him upside the head. I just wasn't that kid. There was another incident. I was in eighth grade, and this one really was a long-lasting incident. I was playing basketball with my buddies, and a bunch of high school guys come, four guys, and they come over to the court, and one of them I recognize, his name is Bagel Bob. I have no idea what his name was, he was just referred to Bagel Bob as Bagel Bob, and he was in, in our neighborhood. And they said, okay, get off the court, we want to play. Well, we're eighth graders, you know, we're like feeling our oats. He said, no way, we're playing. You want to play? You've got to challenge us for the court. That's how it works around here. And these guys, they chuckle, they laugh, they smirk, and they say, all right, yeah, we'll play you for the court. 11-point game. So these guys are huge. They're really big. And they're just throwing the ball over our heads. We, we hardly ever even touch the basketball. And uh, at one point, Bagel Bob has the ball, and he's dribbling down the court, and he's coming right for me. And, and he's moving fast, and he's big. And I'm thinking, I am not going to move out of the way. And he comes right up to me. He jumps up. He tosses the ball, and he comes down with all of his might, the heel of his foot right on my right toe. He smashes my right toe. And I, I thought... I thought he broke my toe. It really, really hurt. And I was really, I was pissed off. But there was nothing I could do. I thought, wow, th th this is how the world works. These guys just come in and they do what they want. They just take advantage of people. And the toe was in definitely bad shape. It didn't, I didn't break it. But I lost two toenails over the course of a, week, a year and a half or two years. And, and it was bruised. And I had to start walking on the side of my foot because it hurt my big toe. And the truth of the matter is, is that that toe bothers me to this day. It doesn't bend. It's got a great big knuckle on it. And there isn't a day that goes by that I am not aware of this toe. And so, once again, pecking order, right? You know, Bagel Bob, and here's, here's where I am, okay? I've got, I've got my spot in the pecking order line. Watch out for those people up there. But, you know, as any plumber will tell you, shit flows downhill. And so I realized that my place in the pecking order, there was a whole bunch of people down below me. And so I could, you know, I could take advantage of those folks, and I did. I didn't do a lot of bad things, but I, I did stuff. I was a bully, a little bit. And one thing in particular I remember, I was going to school, I was in fifth grade, and this gal in my neighborhood, Barbara B., was also walking to school. It was a beautiful spring day. It was warm, and she was carrying her winter coat. And I kind of snuck up behind her, and I grabbed the coat out of her arms. And I walked up a little further up the sidewalk, and I threw her coat in a garbage pail. Wow. Okay. 
I, I'm, I'm not proud of this. Definitely, I am ashamed of this. But I don't know what this was all about. You know, it was like a power play. I was being a bully. I was being mean. It was a really mean thing to do. And uh, maybe it was some attempt, a fifth grade attempt at being flirtatious. I have no idea. Like, hey, Barbara, here I am. Let me take your coat and throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and poor Barbara walked up to the garbage pail, and she pulled out her coat, and she was really humiliated. And she felt terrible, and she was really mad at me. She said, look at this. And there's this stain on the lining inside the coat. Look at this. Well, I got to tell you, I carried that stain with me all my life. So that stain and my big toe, those are like, you know, that's sort of like where my karma's wrapped up. And five years ago, I get an email, and it's from Barbara. Now, we had not talked since high school. But Barbara sends me this email, and it says, Dear Frank, we are on the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest holiday in the Jewish calendar. And I have decided I forgive you. I forgive you for throwing my coat in the garbage, and I forgive you for your, your, your bullying me. Wow. So there it is. She carried around that stain as long as I did. And yet, she was telling me, you're absolved. It's cool. I'm letting it go. You're forgiven. And I thought, wow. That's how the world works. That's really how the world works. It's, it's, like, it's like forgiveness, compassion, kindness, gentleness, love. It's not through the brutality of, of pushing and taking and stomping on people who are in front of you. That's all dysfunction. That's not how the world works. And I thought of, uh, thought of Gandhi. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And then I also thought, even of that woman who's married to the guy who hangs out in the White House. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, in case you can't actually just love, at least hashtag be best. And I thought, okay, I'm taking a cue from Barbara B. And so I give a shout out to Bagel Bob. Bagel Bob, wherever you are, I forgive you, man. I forgive what you did. And I just hope that you have learned as much from the heel of your foot as I have learned from the big toe of mine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.